Right now, there are 162 satellites in orbit measuring the Earth's climate. The data they measure is important. It informs agriculture, weather prediction, and perhaps most importantly, the surface temperatures they measure inform government action or inaction on climate change. But what if I told you that those satellites can be wrong in measuring the Earth's temperature by several degrees Celsius, and that those incorrect satellite measurements go into climate models that can be off by 20 degrees? The explanation of why involves a giraffe, some universities, and this gravel monkey. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. To support your learning in science and maths outside of the classroom, go to the link in the description. This is Dr. Tom Dowling. Long-term viewers of the channel may recognise him from the crash course cryosphere that we made together here. These days, he's a scientist at the National Centre for Earth Observation, using a technique called remote sensing. Essentially, all the remote sensing is, is actually what we're doing here, like with this camera. Um, remote sensing is being physically removed from something and measuring it. To say, take temperature as a key example here, uh, if you touch something, you can feel how hot it is, you are directly sensing how hot it is. Whereas if you had a thermal camera that's, you know, mounted on anything, it could be a drone, could be a satellite, could be an aircraft, uh, and that camera tells you this point is this hot you have remotely sensed that temperature rather than contact sense the temperature. There are lots of ways that a satellite can measure the Earth's temperature, but to be specific, Tom is looking at a very widely used satellite called SIVIRI. SIVIRI uses what's called the radiative method, basically measuring the infrared radiation given off by the Earth's surface, a bit like a thermal camera. Essentially, you look at how much radiation is in one por portion of the spectrum, how much radiation in another, and then do some maths between that, and that can tell you how hot the surface of the Earth is. That maths obviously uses thermal physics to convert a measurement by a satellite into a temperature on the ground. But the equations involved need certain numbers to be put into them, certain parameters which can only be measured on the ground. And Dr Dowling was interested in a particularly important parameter called the emissivity of the ground. So the emissivity is essentially simply how good an object is at retaining or readmitting uh, radiation in the thermal portion of the spectrum in this case. So for example, if you've got a perfect emitter, all the energy and radiation comes into it, or is present in it, is emitted. So it's perfectly, it's one, essentially. But obviously that's never true, and it's particularly not true at a multi-kilometer scale, which is what we're working at here, where you've got plants growing all over the place, you've got trees, you've got bare soil, you've got water, we all have different emissivity properties. What does that mean for your temperature? You, you need this number to calculate the temperature. How do you know what this number is and how do you get it? This may not seem like much of a problem. Like, shouldn't you just go out into the wild and measure how emissive, reflective everything is and then you're done, you've got the parameter. And people have done this and they've mostly done a good job. But the problem is that, well, Satellites break the Earth's surface down into pixels, with each pixel being up to a few kilometres across. For the benefit of Americans watching, that means they can be over 500 bald eagles wide. Within a pixel, different processes affect the overall emissivity. For example, tree cover changing over the year changes how reflective the land is in different months, as do changes in surface moisture and what kind of rock is underfoot. Scientists went out and established what are called validation stations. Here they measure the relevant parameters like emissivity, and send those numbers to the remote observation people to use in their equations. They then compare what the satellite thinks the temperature should be in their pixel, using the parameters they measured, like emissivity, with the temperature they measure on the ground. This process is called validation, and it's absolutely essential for science. The problem is the scientists set up these validation stations close to where their universities were. If you look at a map of land surface temperature, what well, I'm interested in here, validation stations, there are two in the continent of Africa, and then there's like 50 in America. You know, that's, that's the kind of disparity you're looking at. And that is significant because the processes that take place within a given pixel will depend on where that pixel is. So while scientists might have measured how a forest in North America affects the emissivity of the pixel it's in, a forest in Sub-Saharan Africa might have completely different effects on the emissivity of its pixel, and different again from the effects that a forest in Southeast Asia might have on the emissivity of its 
pixel. Quite apart from having different species, different trees within the forests, they may grow in a completely different way over the course of a year. One of the very big differences between where we've established this out in Kenya and your typical kind of temperate zone or even North American as a whole zone uh, is that you've got bimodal rainfall patterns. So it's a semi-arid savanna. Your vegetation is dead, senesced being the technical term. I'm not a biologist, it's dead, but it's all there still. It's this brown stuff. And a lot of the algorithms that get your emissivity number from a satellite, they use green and near infrared light to tell you how much plant stuff is there. And if it's got all the plants there, it says use this number. If it says there's not much plants there, use that number. What happens when you've got dead plant there? This means then that the temperature a satellite returns for a given pixel can be obtained using numbers, using parameters in the equations that are just woefully inappropriate. They're just wrong. And to be more specific, those numbers are more likely to be wrong if the pixel contains vegetation of some kind and is away from Europe and North America, where basically all the vegetation emissivity data has come from. And to be as clear as I can, that covers a lot of the world. And actually, this is one of the big things that came out of the Paris Agreement, uh, is that quite rightly, places around the tropics uh, and um, in the global south said, well, hang on, you want us to make all these changes. We don't know, we don't know your data is any good for our locality. How do we know what's happening with climate change in our part of the world? Um, and that's one of my personal drivers is to, you know, help fix that and change that technology transfer and also going out and doing the measurements with, with people from the area. As he hinted at earlier, Tom went out to Kenya as part of this work to set up a validation station for Savannah in a place called Kapiti. We are working with uh, the in-country partner ILRI, who is the International Livestock Research Institute, and we were establishing this on their research ranch, uh, which is about two hours southeast of Nairobi called Kapiti. Uh, and Kapiti is fantastic because it's a managed rangeland savanna, and they do science there. So the first challenge was basically getting my head around all these moving parts. Where's the equipment got to go? I, I ended up shipping two and a half tons of equipment to Kenya, just about fitted it all in two Land Rovers, uh, and then drove it out to the site and then we had to build it. So it's amazing how much an A-level in design and technology comes in useful. I, re I remember very strongly, I was, when I was an A-level sixth former, people visiting, like whose kids were going to come in. I was like, oh yeah, I love design tech, I like being a bit practical, I like putting stuff together. And some somewhat snobby older gentleman said, oh, you're, you're, you're at a grammar school, what are you doing in the woodwork shop? Well, let me tell you, sir, it turns out practical skills, very handy in science. Before we dig into the results of Tom's research though, and just how wrong the satellites and models can be, I just want you to hear this story of how fieldwork can be a bit different to theory and how stuff can go wrong in ways that you would never plan for. Kapiti is an amazing place. Um, so they, they have a, a lot of cattle there, but they also have a lot of zebra. Uh, they have lion, there's hyena, there's eagle, there's all kinds of stuff. And in particular, there are giraffes. Now, I don't, I don't know if you've ever been to a savannah, but generally fairly flat, which is one reason why you're attracted to it, because we didn't have to deal to too many slope issues with our validation effort, while still getting the vegetation element nailed down, uh, with a few trees sticking up. Now, obviously giraffes, quite tall, you know, uh, we're installing masts, which are 15 to 20 meters tall. Um, and giraffes are very curious, intelligent animals, particularly when you put a 15 to 20 meter tall shiny thing up in the air. And it's got a little bit of fence around it, but not too much because you want the natural grazing to on the surface around where you're monitoring. Um, and unfortunately, about two months after we'd installed it, I think a giraffe, I like to say it got a bit amorous. It was a slightly amorous giraffe, got a bit close up and personal. Uh, and to be honest, it probably it got, uh, got its leg caught on one of the guy lines possibly, probably and panicked. Now giraffes are strong it turns out because these are aluminium and steel masts that are, you know, 20 centimeters diameter at the base, bent in half completely ripped out the ground, bent in half, all my very expensive, delicate instruments smashed into the ground. Um, and in fact, we had a wildlife monitoring camera that caught the culprit uh, walking away from the scene with somewhat of a crazy angle, because uh, obviously it was now all on the ground. 
Um, so yeah, I lost. I lost one of my masts to a to a randy giraffe. It's stuff like this that made me do a theoretical PhD, not a practical one. <laughs> Post reconstruction, what did Tom find? Satellites. There's a satellite called MODIS, which a lot of the world relies on. Uh, it's a US satellite, um, and it's generally speaking more wrong than the initial validation work that was done in the past has shown. In particular, it's and this is a running theme actually through a lot of the sensors. They they struggle when the surface temperature is really high, and also this is something that the models are struggling with because we can not only validate satellites, which are measuring these surfaces, we can also validate the global climate circulation models and local weather prediction models who have surface temperature as an element within them and see how correct they are. We measured a variety of different models and sensors and the overall message is they're okay. They're not as good as people think they are, probably, because the, the more, this more complex environment is basically less well represented or less well coped with. The key message really is that we're, there's a cold bias in nearly all of these things. All, particularly models, are really bad at it, but also a lot of the satellite sensors are not capturing the true peak surface temperatures. Now, this is really important because you're missing a lot of energy from the system. And also, if you look at agriculture applications, crops can really suffer when the temperatures get really high. And also, the insects that feed on them uh, behave differently under different temperatures. So if you've got your temperature wrong by up to potentially 20 Kelvin for some of these things, that's a lot of energy missing. That's a lot of heat and surface temperature missed. Um, and so that's, that's a real concern. If you came into this video expecting me to say that satellites and climate models are predicting too much warming and the world is staying at the same temperature it always has, after all, I'm afraid the data indicates the exact opposite. Because of biases in how satellite observations work, specifically in applying parameters like the emissivity that have been measured almost entirely in Europe and America, our satellite measurements are specifically underestimating how hot things are getting during the day in places like Africa. And climate models are even worse at this, and outside of places in the developed world have a more substantial cold bias. Something that I want to stress, however, is that scientists are aware of these problems. This is why Tom is doing this work. Science is a process that needs validation data like this and continually iterates and improves and gets closer and closer to representing the real world in equations and data. At the moment, however, there is reason to believe that the tropics and the global south, without appropriate parameterization of things like vegetation, are actually substantially hotter in the day than we currently think they are, and will be harder hit by climate change than the models currently suggest. I wanted to bring you the story, A, because it shows some of the complexity in global modern science, and B, because it also shines light on the essential but not exactly glamorous work of validation, but mostly because it shows how bad science still is at utilising expertise that comes from somewhere other than the developed world. Something that I'm still struggling to get right, um, it's there's very little funding in it. When you put in a funding proposal, um, it can be hard to get the money to enable it, because it takes money and time to build the relationships, to enable um, academics in the host country to get involved, you need funding to enable that and it has to be budgeted properly, which it so rarely is. And it's a huge loss. Um, not only is it, you know, morally dubious to say the least to go into a country, get the data, leave and give nothing back. It's also you're losing out on so much. I learned so much about the biology and the vegetation cycling that's vital to know about in terms of answering the questions. Um, from working with the people who, funnily enough, live and work there. People do still forget about it, and it's something that I think one of the solutions is for funding agencies to make it a compulsory part of overseas field work, which it certainly isn't at the moment, but also to recognise the effort and work that goes into making it happen properly. Right? In dealing with climate change, the stakes could not be higher. And as Tom's work shows, we're not doing a good enough job measuring anywhere other than the West, validating anywhere other than the West, working with anyone other than in the West. Asian countries like China and India are building up their facilities and their expertise and working closely with scientists in the West, but we in the West need to do more. We need to support science in the developing world, in the global South. And I am proud to call Tom my friend for doing his bit in trying to combat this really important problem.
Let's say for the Warhammer game we played after this interview though, whereas Eldar beat my space marines. Tom, you boss! Science in school is really just memorising equations. It's passive. But in reality, as this video shows, the subject is active. Science is a doing word. You science by doing, by solving problems with theory and data. This means that the way we learn science in school isn't really the best way to do so. The best way to learn it is by solving problems and developing understanding by getting stuff wrong and improving. This is exactly how educational website Brilliant.org and its associated app work. Brilliant is a perfect companion to learning scientific material. That could be physics, chemistry, computer science, biology or maths in school by presenting you with problems that start easy and get harder. I've said it before and I'll say it again, if I was in school or university now, I would be using Brilliant to strengthen my learning. With daily challenges to introduce you to new subjects, countless quizzes perfect for revision, and inspirational content beyond the curriculum like quantum computing and machine learning, Brilliant is the perfect companion to any science student. To get access to all this, or to gift access to a student in your life, go to brilliant.org slash simonclark, and the first 200 people who go to that link will even get 20% off their annual subscription. If you like this video, you'll love Brilliant, so go check them out. Thank you so much for watching, and thanks of course must go to Dr. Tom Dowling for being so generous with his time. Less so for being so generous with his Eldar's firepower. As I said earlier, I think the work that Tom is doing is really important. And if you would like to learn more, there are links down there in the description to Tom's work and also to the organizations he worked with out in Kenya. If you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. You can like it, you can comment, you can share it with friends. If you wanna see more, you can subscribe. You're not new to YouTube, I don't need to tell you this. Basically, just thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>